through the locations where I'll be talking and showing you pictures and visuals from tonight. So how do we collect a lot of this information that I'm presenting to you, right? As I said, from visiting the field locations, but also by interviewing over the last three weeks, 72 people from different sectors, from the multilaterals like USAID, from the government at the national level here in Argesa, but also at the local level in the Sinag region, from businesses, I've been speaking with CEOs of businesses based here in Somaliland and also abroad, but most importantly, the landowners, the people who actually control what's happening to the frankincense. And in addition to the landowners, the communities, and the chiefs and the elders, whom without, there will be no change. So here we are running a focus group. This is Ahmed Didi. And we traveled the region for three weeks or two and a half weeks doing just this. We met with chief elders and CEOs of businesses to get diverse opinions on what the state of the frankincense market is and also the trees. Six years ago when I did a supply chain analysis for Somaliland, this is what I came up with. You had Somali landowners who were moving resins to Somali sorting houses where women were sorting and then Somali middlemen were moving a lot of the resins to Arab wholesalers. And those Arab wholesalers were then exporting to the EU, to the United States and China, where it was turned into value-added products such as oils, and the final consumers uh, across those countries as well, US, China, and the EU being some of the largest consumers of secondary manufacturing of resins into oils. Well, here we are now in 2016. We have a very different situation. The supply chain has modified and changed drastically in a short period of time. We have Somali landowners who move their product through, sometimes through Somali middlemen, many of whom are employed by the exporters now instead of being independent. The Somali sorting houses, which used to be predominantly in Aragavo, have now shifted to Burao. Um, a process which I'll talk more about uh, in, as I go on, the separation of bark from the resins being exported to Ethiopia, and that the major resin buyers and exporters moving the resin through Berbera. There is a distillery now in Argesa that was not here six years ago. But these major exporters, instead of selling, to, selling the resins directly to the Middle East, are now exporting to their own distilleries abroad. And these distilleries are in the United Arab Emirates, in the European Union, in the UK, uh, in the United States, and in China. The amount of exporters and distillers has grown. There are much more competition in the supply chain than there was six years ago. And also, there's many more people who are uh, demanding and want to buy these oils. Um, I'd, I'd like to pass a bottle of oil around, actually. If, if we can pass that around, people can see that. OK, next slide. So here's the resin. And I'm sure most of you have seen it before. But what's changed so much in that su supply chain is that this used to be the primary export to the Middle East. And now the oils that we're passing around is what's really demanded in the marketplace. Yeah? Next slide. This is a sorting station, a warehouse in Aragavo. This is owned by Samgum. And they had some very beautiful resin stored there. So I started to do an economic analysis of the changes in the supply chain to see what, what impacts this is having on the region. In 2010, as you can see from the slide here, one kilo of resin, of raw resin, was, was being bought from landowners and harvesters for about one dollar, US dollar. Hmm? Landowners at that time 
were underbidding each other. They were fighting amongst themselves to get their product sold. So I'd say 90 cents, you'd say 80 cents, and the exporter then would be in a very good position because we are underbidding each other to sell the product because the demand was not there yet. Well, mainly exporters of resin to the Middle Eastern market. And what's changed? What's changed now? In 2016, I'm coming back into the same areas. A kilo of resin is, on average, selling for $6 US. The major exporters are now competing with each other. Instead of landowners and harvesters underbidding each other to move product, now we have major exporters competing for a limited supply. There's only so much resin that can be harvested every year or every season. There's a high demand now, a much higher demand on the international market. Um, and the, instead of exporting to the Middle East as incense, it's exported mainly for distillation into oils, which hopefully everyone will get a chance to, to, to experience. The last analysis in partial that was done was by the FAO in 1991. And at that time, they estimated about 1,200 metric tons per year of Carteri resins and about 900 tons of Ferriana resins that were being produced and exported. I'm still analyzing these numbers. I'm using shipping records. I'm going to the ministries to try to pull numbers. It's very hard to get at this number. There's a lot of reasons why, so maybe we can talk about that in discussion, of why it's hard to come up with the exact numbers of how much resin is being exported. But it's, it's still unclear. So I'm operating from these 1991 figures. I've confirmed this with many of the exporters. They tell me that we're, we're still looking at about the same numbers. So why does that matter? Well, in 2010, if you remember my figure on the last slide, with $1 a kilo at the, the 1,200 and 900 tons, that was only representing about $210,000 going into the, into the country, right? Going, being distributed to landowners and harvesters to buy their product. In 2016, at $6 a kilo, it represents $1.26 million being paid to landowners and harvesters to buy their resins. Now, if you remember, I just told you that the resins are not what's the, the, the most value. It's the oils. One kilo of resin at $6, when distilled, yields $80 for a one ounce bottle, which is going around. That bottle that's passing around costs $80 U.S. If I look at just one distillery that I know about, I have to keep it confidential, but that one distiller grossed $2 million last year from the sale of these oils. So you can see that we have a major disproportionality. We have major disproportion in gains between primary extractors of resins and secondary manufacturers. This is not a new story for Africa or anywhere across the south, um, but it's happening here in your country as well. So what does all this economics have and the supply chain, what, what are the impacts on the environment? Yeah? And in, in my estimation, from all the reports I've read, this is the least understood aspect of what's happening. I think there's pretty good understanding of the market, there's pretty good understanding of the supply chain, and the value of the product. I know there's businessmen here in the room who can talk more about this. It's pretty well understood. What's not very well understood is what are the environmental impacts of this supply chain that I just laid out for you. So we were lucky enough to spend time here in the Almado, one of the most beautiful places I have ever seen in the entire world. I'd like to spend more time there. And when we got there to Magdar Mogli, we started assessing the trees 
and it was very, very sad because the change in six years in the health of the trees is drastic. If you can see this picture clearly, this is a tree, this is a frankincense tree that has had its bark stripped off pretty much from as high up as you can reach all the way to the bottom. This is a new practice. I did not see this practice six years ago in any of the locations that I visited. I had not seen this before. So this is new. This is a direct impact due to the increase in demand and price. And it drastically weakens the tree health. This tree will die. There's no question that this tree will be dead shortly. Yeah? So by cutting the bark, removing the cambium, and removing these layers of the, of the tree's skin, right? Just like you and me, if we take off our skin, we become more susceptible to disease. Yeah? So what's happening here is these trees are now extremely susceptible to a pest called hare and ultimately mortality and death. Um, well, what does this mean? This means an overall decrease in resin output. So if the trees are being stripped like this, they can only produce resin for a few years, if we're lucky. That's me looking very sad at finding dead stripped trees. You can see this tree was completely stripped. This is in Ka'a and is now dead. So we kept looking. And this area in Magdar Mowgli, again, in a World Heritage Site, should be a UNESCO World Heritage Site. This should be a national park in the middle of one of the most biodiverse and beautiful ecosystems that I have ever seen. The frankincense trees are dying en masse. We stood in the center and we did a radius check and counted how many dead trees we could see. And we were astounded by how many trees were dead and dying. If they weren't completely dead yet, they were very sick and unhealthy. Next slide. So the other practice that I witnessed is overcutting. Now when I was here six years ago, there were problems with overcutting. There were. But nothing like I'm seeing now. It has drastically accelerated. Again, the price has gone up so high. So the desire to overcut and to remove resins as quickly as possible is present in the supply chain and in the economics that caused this to happen. So here's a tree. And everywhere you see a red spot here is a cut or a wound. This tree alone had over 60 cuts. Hmm? It's about, I think this was the tree we, we estimated to be about 50 years old. A tree of this size and of this age, traditionally, long before six years ago, 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 years ago, traditional practices would have limited this to 8 to 12 wounds, period. No more. No more. So again, this process, this practice, is weakening the tree health. It leaves the tree susceptible to hare and higher mortality rates. Again, decreasing the overall resin output, both quality and quantity. When a tree is sick like this, when it's over wounded, or if it's been, have its bark stripped off, the quality of resins, it makes, it just makes sense that the quality of the resins would decrease, that the chemical complexity that the tree is able to manufacture would drop. Next slide. This was a tree that had been so over wounded we couldn't even count the wounds. It was too difficult um, because there was so much wounding that had happened to this tree that it was in the process of dying and it was still exuding the milk of the Boswellia tree, but it was on its way out. The other phenomena that I saw this time, which I didn't see before, was overtapping of non-mature trees. So if you, if you look at this tree, you see how green it is. Yeah? It's too young. It's too young.
to be harvested. It's too young to be cut like this. Again, traditional practices and traditional knowledge set an age of around 40 for mature trees before being tapped. This tree right here is probably about 12. So even the trees that are not ready are being tapped. This is one of the research locations we were on, and we were witnessing young trees. This had not been tapped yet, but this was what we were finding because all of the adult trees were dead. That lines up with studies that have been done in Ethiopia that show high mortality rates, high death rates of adult trees, um, with young trees propagating and growing, but not having trees that are tappable because of their age. When I was here six years ago, um, I tagged this tree location from this cave and from the edge of the cliff, which is just about 10 feet behind Ahmed here. So here's the tree now. It's completely dead. And this is a feriana tree, Boswellia feriana. And this gentleman is a landowner and harvester, and he's telling me that the trees are dying like this every year. Actually, there's two major causes death to this tree. One is unsustainable harvesting. Yep. The second is, you know, hare. Yes. Yeah. They harvest the whole year round. They harvest continually the whole year. The 12 months of the year, they cut, they cut, they cut, they cut and harvest. Yeah. Again and again. And finally, at the end of the time, this is the result of over harvesting. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Well, there we have it. That's in six years that that happened. And when I was here last time, they told me in ten years they felt like their entire frankincense ecosystem would be in peril. Yeah. Well, there it is. I, I, it's not what I was hoping to find. Yep. Stephen, you want to go over there to give scale? You want to just stand down there at the end? Stay right there, Amad Amado. We're going to give scale. Just stay there for a second. This tree was uh, at least 60 years old when I was here, so, you know, this kind of corroborates that the adult trees are the ones that are dying out the fast. Everywhere we're going, we're seeing the trees 40 years and over are the ones dying. And here, I'm not really seeing any babies, so. Okay. Okay, next slide. Oh, off now. Oh, okay. So as mentioned in the video clip there, the process of continuous harvesting is also another very big change from six years ago. Traditionally, 20 and 30 and 40 years ago, the traditional method was to tap a tree for two years and to let that tree rest for one year in between. When I was here six years ago, that really wasn't happening very much still, but the continuous harvesting that we're seeing now is a new phenomenon that's new. Um, reports are, especially on the carteri trees, or mainly on the carteri trees, is that they're subjected to two rounds of harvesting per year. So as the formal harvest, the, the, the legitimate harvesting season that's ending right now, harvesters will go back out, and make new cuts, and harvest again. Um, as it rains, the trees will get no rest at all. Again, this weakens tree health and leaves these trees susceptible to pests and higher mortality and decreases overall resin quality and quantity. We tried to set up a study plot here and we couldn't because all of the adult trees were dead. There were lots of babies growing, which was giving me some hope. But you can see how changed or how
desolate this landscape has become. Uh, this is more now to the southwest of the escarpment, uh, the geologic feature of which frankincense trees grow on. Um, but it's, it's, uh, <laughs> this is a devastated and degraded landscape. Probably also due to charcoal production. So what are the social impacts of the environmental impacts? Because we depend on the environment, all of us, for everything. Our whole lives come from our, our subsistence comes from the planet. So it always has social impacts when the environment is degraded. Well, in this case, we have resource conflict leading to community destabilization and ultimately violence. I was seeing it in every community that I went into that there's a real conflict between family members, clan members, clan to clan, buyer to buyer, exporter to exporter. We have a big competition going now to get at these resins because they're very valuable on the world market. But that's destabilizing these communities. Ecologically, it's destabilizing these communities because when you damage ecosystems and degrade land to this extent, you lose other services. You lose water, you lose biodiversity, you lose wildlife. It has very big social impacts. A crash in the supply leading to increased poverty is coming. Right now, what you're experiencing in the market is what we call a peak, where the, the resin quantity and quality is slowly starting to decrease, but the price is still high. So landowners aren't quite feeling the hurt yet, but it's peaking. And what happens with peaks is the longer you stay on the top of the peak, the harder the crash is economically and ecologically on the other side. The social impacts of this are displacement and having environmental refugees. We spoke with several people who were conveying to us that they will just have to move somewhere else because they have no other source of livelihood. This is it. This is what they have. And if the trees are gone, they will not be able to stay in some of these communities and they will have to move. And quite possibly, they will move to other places that still have good trees, and the same cycle will start again. If they cannot locate other places where there are trees, they will have to move into the cities. And so this is a process we call now environmental refugees, internally displaced people, not because of war, but because of environmental collapse. And we're seeing this all across different parts of the world. This is very real. Um, the other thing, the other social impact, which was um, everywhere we went, was increasing cot addiction. Um, and also noted that illegal harvesters, mainly youth, going behind the legitimate, legitimate landowners and illegally harvesting trees to get money to buy cot. So the cot is having a major impact on the natural resources. The combination of the degradation of the environmental condition along with increasing cot addiction exacerbates what we call a poverty trap and keeps people in poverty. There's a loss of cultural heritage and a sense of place. The frankincense trade is as old as the pharaohs. It has existed for thousands of years. The species of Boswellia trees that grow in Somaliland are some of the highest quality and best trees anywhere in the growing region across the Middle East and other parts of the Horn of Africa. It is absolutely your national treasure, these forests, and they are rare and unique. We met a lot of people who were feeling depressed and hopeless and angry at a lot of things at the national government for not doing anything, at each other for, being in a, uh, for families not managing the trees well, with the buyers and exporters for not investing in the communities. There was a lot of high emotion, a lot, more than I have ever seen in this country around a resource issue. 
and as high as some of the emotions that I've seen in combat zones where I work in other countries around Blood Diamonds and Sierra Leone, the emotion levels were that high. And I predict they will only get higher. There's a lack of trust and a growing animosity towards companies, government, multilaterals, NGOs. They vetted me thoroughly to make sure that I was none of these things, that I was an impartial um, researcher. And so I should tell you that my funding comes from four different sources, not only this one company, but by third party verifiers in the EU who want to know if the oils they are buying are coming from sustainably harvested trees. I can't tell them yes now. I have to go home and tell them no. And that has a very big impact on the market overall, but we're, gonna, we're not going to give up there. We're going to look for solutions. Um, also, <clears throat> increasing population pressures and encroachment was leading to family feuds. So we were seeing many more family feuds. Uh, and that, 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 dis that disruption in who manages the land within a family was, was really leading to um, degradation of the land and, and overuse. Because there weren't coordinated efforts amongst family members. When it's my year to, to profit and it's your year next year, we don't necessarily have the same management practices and so that starts even more fighting. The families that have coordinated and agreed to method for harvesting that's more sustainable are, the, are the, in the minority. And they're struggling. They're there. There's people who are trying to do this right. There are people who are really trying to do this properly, but they're struggling. Is that another little video? Um, so I've just asked him what he'll do if the trees in this area continue dying. Actually, he said if this dies continue, just the environment become very harsh and severe then I, my, my family, will abandon, will move from here to the towns. And so they'll become internally displaced people due to environmental collapse. When the frankincense trees die, does it affect the rest of the, the forest? I think it depends on each other, you know, this plant community. It depends, you know, on each other. On each other. When this die, the other may come. Right. Also die. So we don't really know. We don't really know the impact of losing these trees on the forest because it's the first time they're dying so rapidly. Yeah. Yeah. I explained, you know, when we don't know the impact, what will be the impact. We know this one, the other plants died. I think right. we'll see the result of that. You know. Right. So we don't know yet because it's, it's happening very rapidly and it's the first time in his lifetime yeah. to have the trees die off like this yeah. due to overharvesting yeah. and pests. I'm very sorry. This is a situation analysis that I put together showing the complexities of the interactions that are exacerbating this problem. I'll just briefly touch on this part because I really want to get to discussion with all of you and hear from you and answer questions. But let's not forget climate change and the impacts of the shifting of the rains and drought and the impact that's having and stressing the ecosystems. Um, so, Well, there's always hope. And a lot of the hope that I saw is that these are extremely resilient trees. They grow in such a harsh spot. They, they, they occupy micro niches, we call them in volcanic rock 
where small amounts of soil collect and a little bit of water, and they propagate. And they can also be propagated by clipping them and replanting them. So they have two mechanisms for growing, cutting from clipping and repropagating, and also from seed. The presence of baby trees in many of the locations that I went to signify that these forests can regenerate if they are well managed. If we act now, if something is done, these forests can regenerate. Of course, there still will be or might be a market glut where there will not be enough trees of mature age to tap. But there's hope. And so I want to leave you with a couple solutions. Next slide. Um, I don't like to just talk and I don't like to just do research. I actually like to get things done. And so part of what I'm doing now back here in the Capitol is pushing very hard as many people in authority positions and funders that I can to implement some of these solutions and to act. And one of the first ones is to create a council of frankincense producing communities. That's the elders, the chiefs. Um, to get them all together to work on this problem. The second one is to establish a frankincense exporters association and build a business code of conduct for harvesting that would not allow stripping, overwounding, allowing the trees to rest, and providing investment incentives for landowners to comply. There needs to be at the same time a national ban and government enforcement on overharvesting. It can't just be the private companies or the landowners and chiefs. It has to be the government too. So we need a public-private partnership to deal with this. And that's partly would be enforced by a forest protection unit that, as I understand, existed in this country at one time. We need to support ongoing ecological monitoring of the growing region by independent evaluators like myself and the team that I work with. I could not do this by myself. Um, and establish community-based forest protection and education initiatives. So there's my contact information for anyone who wants to contact me for further discussion. And I think we'll move into questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Anjanete. Actually, I mean, it's very distressing and very painful uh, reports what's happening in, in the field, really. Yeah. It's sad to see, I mean, three stands that has been thriving for thousands of years, as he has mentioned, is dying fast. It's our heritage dying too. So um, I know your study is focused on frankincense, but equally, you know, Mech Malmal is also priced higher now than the ordinary frankincense. Uh, first of all, do you think it's also going through the same fate or not? Uh, that's one question. The other thing, uh, question is that, you know, uh, you just lastly you talked about regeneration. That, that's where the hope is. Uh, but also, I mean, uh, I don't know, before the collapse of the uh, previous government, there was some attempts to domesticate uh, frankincense. Uh, already, you know, some uh, other species are being domesticated, like the Cordoxia edulis, we call it Yeb. The henna. So, uh, given you know the uh, the spatial ecological ecological niche that the frankincense uh, thrives in, what are the challenges in domesticating uh, frankincense? That's another question. A third question will be that uh, you know most of this the parking of is going, you know, the park goes to Ethiopia. Yeah. It's used widely in Ethiopia. I think that, that could be it's a suggestion. That could be, you know, the authorities can stop, you know, exportation of that uh, park. It can reduce, you know. So, uh, and another question is that, you know, I mean, is that too much? I don't want to 
forget any of them. Okay. <laughs> okay. So the first one about myrrh, um, we intended to also do evaluation of the myrrh trees. That will be on the next trip. Um, it's a, they grow in a different area that cross a wider zone, um, and so it's unclear actually right now. Um, I, I can't confirm or deny that the, the myrrh trees are in peril um, because they, we did not get to evaluation of them, but we plan to. Uh, it is definitely true that the demand for myrrh products and myrrh oils is increasing in the, in the international market. Um, all of these products now have new markets. Um, the oils that's going around is uh, some of the compounds in it are FDA in the United States, uh, federally uh, recognized and certified to treat arthritis for anti-inflammatory properties, um, used in anti-aging creams. And there are six trials currently going on in China and the United States for the ability of these oils and compounds in these oils to kill cancer cells. So this creates a very different market demand. Myrrh also has many medical applications. You can buy toothpaste made out of myrrh in the United States. Um, it's very healing to the digestive tract. So it's under uh, scientific study. Both, all three are under scientific study for new uses. Um, so we will be back to look more closely at the myrrh trees. Domestication is a very important question. We saw in Gudmo a small nursery that an elder had set up about 40 years ago where he planted just a few trees to experiment with them. They were doing quite well, actually. Um, they were being watered and protected, and they were doing quite well. We saw another plot of land where his son had tried domesticating them and had successfully done that. But there has not been any... Um, academic institution that has taken on creating a nursery. Uh, we're proposing to do that at Sinag University in Aragavo uh, to build capacity and research at the university, but it's the closest. It makes the most sense to experiment with propagation and domestication at that site in Aragavo. One of the challenges is that uh, landowners become very nervous when you take clippings or seeds from the forest because they are afraid that they will be brought to Djibouti or to other countries and planted and that Somali land will lose its genetic rights, its genetic property, um, and that the trade will shift. There's already a lot of rumors that trees have been taken out of here and planted, again, in Djibouti, in Oman, in Yemen. Um, and so we, we, the only way we could prove that is by genetic testing of the trees and, and looking at the genetics of trees in other countries. Um, but so the domestication is extremely important and we plan to set up a study site at University of Sinag and so I encourage students to get involved in that with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. I will not be asking uh, more okay. questions because I mean I hope okay. more, more questions will be coming from the audience. The Francis is sold. Too much income are coming to Somaliland. So when income are coming to Somaliland, jobs are created, things economically improved. Then, you know, when you look at the China and you look at the Japan, they compete in according to economics. So we want, like Somaliland, we want to be like China and Japan to have more income to compete to have economical power, later on a future power, then member of the Security Council, and instead of like um, thinking about the ecology. Okay, my, my question to you is that when one kilo or one ton of francis is actually sold from here, like six dollars, it doesn't it tell us how much it cost in U.S., so later on, those families, we can say, if they cost thirty dollars, we can go back and say, okay, you need to consider, the, you need to reconsider the price, so, and increase it, um, because the international market 
doesn't sell in this way. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'm definitely not suggesting that you stop tapping trees. I'm not suggesting that. What I'm suggesting is that the unsustainable tapping will crash the supply chain. It will move to Oman. It will move to other. They're already doing that. When Somaliland can't meet demand, buyers go to Oman. So do you want this industry to last 10 years or 100 years? Do you want to leave it to the next generation is more the, the question. So I'm not advocating for stopping at all. What I am is to move towards secondary manufacturing so that more profits do stay in Somaliland, that the government revenues collected on the secondary manufacturing are better for the national budget. Um, and absolutely, there's also many other types of trees, gums, and resins that come from Somaliland that can be utilized. The other issue here is diversification of income sources. The profits from frankincense need to be invested into communities so that they can diversify and have other agricultural outputs or other gums and resin outputs so that they're not just relying on one species or two species um, without any other economic opportunities. Dr. Ancileta, uh, for the very um, the, uh, research you have shown us, because I come from that part of the country, I'm from Gudma Bias, I'm a member of parliament, and I, I really know very much all those things you are talking about with, this, with regard to the environmental degradation, how uh, the frankincense trees are being really uh, destroyed and how the whole community is now in despair. And we, myself as a member of parliament from that part, one of the most depressing things that's happening to the, our economy and to the region, we are very much aware of that. But we seem to have not knowing what to do exactly. Initially, uh, I have been even with the community at some time in the 90s, 1997, 2000, we have established a, a company which, were, which we included all of the community to become shareholders. Every person who is a producer of frankincense or who even the tabers who can get tender we have to uh, we start to pull an economy like that so that it becomes a company of the community, not the company of some uh, powerful, uh, economically strong person. Those who cannot get tem uh, tender can come up with uh, five kilos of francs and become shareholders. That's the design we did for such a... We did that because we want to make all the community own the company, and protect and become part of the system so that we can tell them not to uh, uh, debark, not to overproduce, to allow them uh, the tree to rest. But unfortunately, that company was not, because we, we were not having, we, we sent a shipment to Germany at one point, but the Germans uh, somehow were not happy with the way we were, we were, we were not having the packaging system, the, the need system of sending to them. So our next shipment, shipment failed to reach Germany because we have no LC, we have no uh, uh, people who, are, uh, who can assist us in. We sent the, about uh, 50, uh, 50 tons of shipment without, without having any guarantees that our brothers will be, that they will send us money. Anyway, that was, uh, something has gone. At that time, in the 2000, 2001, a kilo of frankincense, of uh, uh, frankincense criteria was 0 0.5 there. 0 0.5 there, it was. And we will send it to Germany with two dollars a kilo. That's the estimation we got. When New companies came. We thought it was hopeful because the area was economically depressed and we were very happy that companies came, companies came and people would get money 
and Frank's economy will boost and the community's economy will grow up. But what you have seen is happening, you know. In Gudma Bias, for example, the social aspect of that economy, at that time, or even, even maybe at 2010, when you were there, the cat trade, somebody used it to take from the, uh, above the escarpment on his back, a bag of cat, chat. The whole town was using only one bag. Somebody will carry it on his back, not on a car. Nowadays, four land cruisers arrive at Gubabiyas, uh, 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 bringing cat uh, to the economy. All the community, all the young people are chewing now, which means addiction, which means uh, no uh, people are, will not go to work at all time, which means as soon as young man raised up, he wants, and the cat arrives, he went, uh, runs to the mountains in order to get some uh, some uh, gum, so that he sells and gets a uh, instead uh, cut. The situation is so dire uh, because the money has arrived into the community when they have no sp no brands. What to do with that money? Which money arrived all of a sudden? All of a sudden, money arrived, and people had no plans what to do with this money. The only thing they will do now is just to to, to chat to. Even their livelihood is economy is not improving. Their health uh, uh, condition is not even uh, getting proper. More money, more poverty. More ill health, more uh, tuberculosis. More, more. Uh, it has become a curse again for us that we have getting so many, uh, getting our kilo of one kilo of uh, uh, of of of, uh, of uh, frankincense for six dollars. This has become a curse to the community now, really, unfortunately. So the whole thing needs a lot of really, but, uh, something must be done to build the environment, and somebody is, some must be done to the communities, a huge, uh, we were thinking of organizing at least a, uh, an organization that will, that will, uh, Together with the community, we are proposing for elders and making uh, an umbrella. But the government institution is extremely important, and we have been thinking of that for lately, so that that becomes more intervening, more aggressive, doing something physical at the village. Unless we do that, which is a governmental institution, which works with the community and solves the, these huge problems. I think this is the one, one of the ways we can approach these things. But thank you very much. Really, we just again, I was trying to forget it, but again, you have made me <laughs> depressed again. Thank you very much. I would like to say, if, I would like to mention a few points for the solution. It's so sad we put profit above, above the people. It's so sad that we put uh, credits above needs, even the rule of Allah from the rule of the people. It's so sad we use nature, natural as a credit card. We buy for everything because of everything is related for money. We cutting trees of all, 50% of trees have in the world have been cutting for the last 100 years because of money. And actually I would like to say, I would like to mention it one thing, that solution belongs to us, not about the government, not about the NGOs, not about the even, it depends on each and every person of us half responsible. Uh, if we don't save the natural and uh, environment, we're not saving us. We're not even, we, we can't leave it. It's our oxygen. It's, it's everything for us. So I'd like to add it that solution depends on the people, not anything else. First, my name is Ahmad Bashir Hassan. Uh, first, I would like to thank Ms. Anjanita and Mr. Awale with their presentation. Really, it was very, 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 very effective presentations and very technical reports. Uh, so, uh, I think the report is very sympathetic, very sympathetic. Really. It was very, 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 you know, power information that I get from Sinak regions and also in Somaliland Hall. So, um, I would like to ask you uh, one question. The question is, you share this, this information with the Ministry of Environment and 
and also could you uh, give us you know rule of uh, and the rules and regulations that we're going to manage that's my question and my point and my contribution is uh, the that we can control this is making you know a shifting a shifting of harvesting for example the government especially the ministry must make you know a uh, you know a protected area that must be harvested in for example five years the other five years are uh, protected area it means to make a shifting that's my contribution but my question is what's the procedures and the methods that we are going to save these natural resources. It's very important to give us, you know, the rules and regulations. And also, we are, uh, for example, uh, proposing the parliament and the government as well to make the rules and regulations to control this. And also, we will be in danger as well. Thank you. حالات السيدة هاي، فنتي أيام مسويين دي قرن بسعرات هاي أو ده الله كده جاي أو ده يعني كي يلا لنتي سبعة، كل واحد كلا هذا الله، وحنا تلا أنا ونسوي دي نو وقت بني، بنك كلا واحد ويا، سدر، جيت كان ما هجيت تدك ودلي هاي وجيت لكن اللي هي وعن شخصيتكم شخصياتكم كوريا هاي مركب إلى لنتي سو وكان يبرانت هاي مركب كمون كأهل وذا اللي هي إنه السنة هرتو يرفع هناك روح بعض وهو بير من اللي هي بير من اللي هي ما هو كرتيت وأذكت هاي السنة هرتو هذا إن جد كا الحين جا مركب قصة وقت جارة هك قصة له مركب أرنتو حيو بعانت هاي دراسة أنت هكسي قطر دير إن إن كنتي إن إن لو كل قلا سدوا حلو قبلا صار هذا السوق هذا إن تدكو ده أنت وجهك قرط عوي شراب لكن أنت بلون عد جيت كان سدعة واستعمال شو حوي عدي لهاي ده يدو شيء جنيسي مركب وزارة الدواء حفلة يعني أنا أود لهاي إن أنا ده بير اللي هاي أنا أوران كارين وحل اللي أنا كقرة حل اللي أنا حقراني وإت إس فيري ديفيكال تو كنترول يو نو this kind of unsustainable utilization of the resources. And we inform the government and the Minister of Environment to control, you know, this unsustainable use of frankness, you know, and raisins. Thank you. So we did present this to the Minister of Environment and I didn't really have a sense that she felt like she could do anything about it which made me uncomfortable. And so your point about the people having to rise up about this and put pressure on the government is very well said. Because without more pressure, I don't feel confident that the, uh, that the central government has either the resources or has this on the national agenda. We need the parliamentary members from the region to push. We need the governor of Sanag to push. We need the academics to push. We need the people to push. We need everybody, the businesses. We need the businesses to push. We need a multi-pronged approach to solve this problem. It will not just come from the top down. It has to come from the bottom up and the top down at the same time. And so we're hoping over the next year to create a very lively campaign around this issue. We're trying to raise more money to do that and hopefully in January I'll be returning with a documentary crew to do a documentary on this issue so that we can push and it also needs to come from the international community who buys these products to push for change. Yeah. As I, as I say here before, um, you are a sustainable expert. Um, so when we are talking sustainable, we know that it contains um, different pillars, for example, social pillar, economic pillar, environmental pillar. And thank you very much. You all mentioned that pillars, but there is a one um, pillar that I don't see your uh, presentation, that you're not uh, still presented, the government. 
the role of government of this issue. What is exactly the role of government to solve this problem as a, as a sustainable issue? That's one question. Um, the other question is that um, you know that when, as generally when the price increases, the supply increases. So you know that in general the role uh, the price of this franchise increased. So do you believe this regulation is caused that external pressure rather than internal pressure? That's the two questions. There's no doubt that the government has to become involved in outlawing and banning some of these unsustainable practices. How that works in Somali culture is something I'm still learning about and understanding clan structures and local and national government structures. But absolutely, there has to be governance here. Without governance, this is what's going to continue happening, is the overstripping and overharvesting of these trees. There's no regulation. And as the price goes up, without any regulation, it will become more of a resource curse. Yeah? Um, do you want to say anything else on that? Actually, the government is, you know, the Minister of uh, Environment and uh, Rural Development is, the, is officially mandated sustainable utilization of the resource and conservation as well. Thank you. I just want to ask you about the awareness and the understanding of the very people who are doing this, about the consequences of uh, this harvest in May. Uh, put on the environment. So are they informed? Are they aware of the consequences of the nomadic people, the absolute nomadic people? How do they feel? In the presentation, you know, particularly, you know, the audios, the question is that being asked, you know, uh, they were exactly saying that, you know, I mean, it's the end for them, you know, to lose those trees. But they are in that poverty trap, you know. So, of course, they know the consequences, but actually there are other driving forces, like, uh, like for example, the cut, addiction, you know, all these kind of things are driving. You add anything? Yeah. Uh, just second that, and that there's no other jobs, and that they know as these trees are being lost, especially the elders, um, that they have no other economic uh, incentives to stay in these communities. There's no other jobs or productivity. So um, they're quite aware of how dire their situation is. I would say the young folks do not understand that as well. One of the questions that I asked repeatedly was, did people see the trees as part of a forest? And the answer was no. So the understanding of the trees as uh, commodities and as trees is more well understood than understanding the links in the ecosystem. So that's something that I, I didn't see a high level of awareness about in terms of understanding uh, ecosystem dynamics. Um, but the young folks do not seem to understand what's being lost. Uh, they're looking for short-term gain, and they're thinking about today. And that's very normal when people are in a poverty trap and they need to eat. Um, they will exploit resources as fast as they can uh, to feed their children. And it's hard to even blame them for that, right? So they're not the enemy either. Um, they're caught in a cycle that is perpetuating poverty and, uh, and environmental degradation. Yes. Yes, please. And Bismillah. And first, Dr. Angelita, Thank you for your professional lecture. And Mark Labadar too, I'm quite I'm Somali. And let us start by an Aba. Let us start with how we see the narke in a birta migrants are in middle class de or high level de or economically or de. But in many children, how no migrants are said de in microorganisms de. كقيب قانون كلا ينو جيت كنا دينته. بس هي كنومي خليه وقرور دمان يا سوق. and سؤال شلون بعدين يدوي الدنيا وحوي. سيدان مركي أي لكشر سوق شهدين يسي أنكار كاي. جيت كنا كنت صنايع لحسنو نولان كرا. 
مرحا مرحا ان ميان ديب جيت كي لوغ بيري كيرين سوغة بدبادو اني ماشا كبحان ان بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ان جيت كان يورت مركي سهورة ان حق روح بضان داتك ملا ان اي رمبا وحكو هدان جيت كي كي يروه الرمو جيت كي نوا جيت ان فنتي جيت لست الله يقعنا جيت بواحا او كبحا بول کشور گیس سرایی بورال ایدا گوبل کسانک لباس گیت با نمی‌دونم حق به حقیب تو هست یا نور که نمی‌دونم حق سرای و حقیقت دل به حال دکه دکه هوا وینو فرکانی کرکا فرنتی مرحله یا حالات آدک ایل در تاسکو به حال این فرن این دیمشود و دنوا تن اینو تو کور همیشه مرکا این مرکا لا ایگو هر که دیمشودی است. سبب تو اگر بدن اون دیما نیا حواهی داره عکس و گاره مرکلا این مرکلا چه فیو؟ او اون لغلا داره این این عیان کن حواهی گیت کدی لا حرام لایه کنن کسی نمرکت دنبا ایو کلا گیت کو مسواهی نو گیت کو دلتو این و حین تر راعه گیت کن این محرک اما میدی کلا بدو با وسیدا انشا نو گیت کو وح جد واحد هو حكم بها درتها سنة دق دق أو بحر حسيت شيء بيأذى وجد كان كبحي أو أخبر هذا كذا وذا يدوان على جيل كرين أن عيد يبي بدل مدنا على هاي أي هذا يشروا حي سببان إنه جد عفمات كيس النقض مد عيفة أو عن وقت كيس كرين وحيلا تشك كتماد أما ضبيها النقطة أما واحدة كوجيستا النقطة لكن هذه جد كا حالا بیاد که دو انتو مان تکبحه و سوی نکسل لامانی چکره یو خونتی گیت امر دیار له و حسوسار کیست نو بدن یو ایو لقون کرا کلی این تاسم من کسی کوره یا دیالا کبی بسم الله اکتیوالی وقت واس اترکت می آباد در پریزنتیشن اف دکتر دکارلو اس you mentioned a few times about uh, abandoning the traditional way of dealing with the trees. Uh, what I was asking, I was wondering if it's the case uh, to document the indigenous knowledge uh, on these specific issues. And as far as I know, nothing is documented, or at least less is documented what could have been done. And as we know, people who know about that knowledge are passing away. And what can be done? Collecting publications, uh, may, mm, I know that there are so many students here, and it's the case to offer these students to at least master's degree, uh, working specifically on collecting this information, I think it's, it should be a must. Uh, and, and this is targeted to Ahmed mainly uh, as a lecturer of the University of Geyser, but also I see that uh, some people from the ministry, uh, the DG, and so many other people were here a few minutes ago. So I think the message uh, should be let us document now because of that is a way that we can save uh, this, this traditional. Would you want to add something about that? I think I think there could be natural diseases, but actually, I mean, the uh, cutting or tabbing, uh, over tabbing or deep parking makes the tree vulnerable, more vulnerable, you know, to these, I mean, kind of uh, organisms. But naturally, I mean, uh, we know hare, you know, even in a li living tree, all kinds of tree, it, it actually attacks, you know. But you know the uh, the vulnerability will be higher when it's actually I mean departed. You know, coming to the uh, the indigenous knowledge, I think I I remember uh, there was one Somali writer uh, Ahmed Artan Hange, I think. Yeah, we know in one of his books, I think he have uh, actually documented uh, uh, something about the uh, the traditional knowledge on cutting and caring and that. But, they, but still, I think that's an area which is, I mean, uh, need to be further uh, investigation and documentation on this issue is very, very important. Yeah. Yeah, the, um, the, the, 
the international community, uh, the, the companies that care about this, are actually looking to my research team to come up with best practices. So I could really use some help and some other students involved. Absolutely, I welcome, I implore you to have other students work with me. Um, right now, we're a, a central team of three, and this is too big of a job for us to do alone. I absolutely want more Somali people involved. I do not plan on staying in the front of this issue. I plan to move back, as Somalis can then take it from there. Um, so uh, absolutely, we need to put together a compendium of best practices. That has been attempted by some of the multilaterals. It did fail um, because they didn't necessarily go to elders and interview them in their homes and in their villages on the ground. Um, that was a big mistake. And so we have to be willing to head out to Sanag and spend weeks sitting with elders and having them show traditional techniques um, and definitely catalog those and compare them against some of the already existing um, uh, documents on traditional knowledge and practices. And not only about the Boswellia trees, but the complementary relationships in the forest between other plant species and the Boswellia trees. So yes, I need more students. Yeah. I would like to make an observation related as to what would be the sustainable solutions in terms of addressing the problems which are really market driven and we're dealing with private property as uh, the colleague that said. Um, given that there is some awareness at the international markets level, uh, perhaps the way forward really is uh, um, an established area of regulation um, called co-regulation whereby uh, industry enforces standards that are agreed with outsiders. And there's a role for government to establish the standards, but the council that you mentioned, for example, in your presentation, uh, could function as a way of releasing and enforcing those standards. And sort of a certification uh, could be part of that process, whereby the community themselves self-certify, and with agreed, you know, sort of a standards, um, different farms are inspected. Uh, by to our own community members uh, as part of the council functions. And buyers are aware of those certifications and value those certifications. So they say a, a, a market-based approach to dealing with this sort of uh, problems which are basically driven by economic demand. That's, that's a perception that I would like to make. Yeah, and you're, you're right on that um, a certification process of um, a third party verification of sustainable management of trees is very necessary here. Whether that's carried out by government or um, uh, schemes such as similar to fair trade, right? Fair trade uh, does not, I, I actually lobbied fair trade several years ago and, and encouraged them to have fair trade frankincense. But because it's a wild crafted product, it's not grown in, in domestic settings. It doesn't qualify. So now there is a new UN compact on biological diversity and bioproduct removal of genetic materials from, uh, from countries all around the world. And it does have mechanisms that we could draw from in terms of certifying sustainably managed trees. It can absolutely be done. We can use drone technologies, the small ones, the little ones you hand fly to look at trees because it's rugged terrain. Um, we can establish where resins come from, who's harvesting them, what kind of practices they're using by ground truthing. Um, it can absolutely be done. We can also use satellite imagery to overlay, to look at the, the health of the canopy. So there's lots of things that can be done to certify, so to speak, sustainably harvested frankincense. Yeah? And a lot of that, I do believe, will come from the international community, especially now when I have to start releasing reports that there is no company that can claim that they are sourcing sustainably harvest frankincense. They can't. It just does it. I, I keep asking to see these sites where the trees are well managed and no one's taken me yet. So I know that I did not cover the entire growing region. So I'm not saying that it does not exist. 
I will be back. Like I said, the team, we have a whole nother round of ground truthing that we'll be doing in January and working on the documentary. So we have to, a lot more ground to cover. Yeah. I'm real environmentalist. Oh, I think uh, this uh, presentation is up to me. Uh, I will, uh, my question is uh, about Dr. Ancelita. Did you, have you ever checked the cities uh, of the land to generate the seeds. My question is like that. So we have um, just begun to do that, taking soil samples and rock samples and trying to understand what, uh, what the trees need and what are the limiting factors for them. That is not well understood here in Somaliland in regards to the t endemic species that grow here. So we've started to work on that. Yeah, we've just started to work on that. Again, I could use more students um, and more cooperation with the universities to, to do this kind of analysis. There's so much that needs to be done, really, there is. So um, there's definitely opportunities to get involved and participate in the research. Just first, I would like to thank Dr. Anjanita and her team. Um, I'm, one, I'm one of the member, well, I'm one of the uh, member, uh, family members who own the land for instance, especially Raqqa's area. So I appreciate you have been talking about Raqqa's. So you saw my brother there, one of my brothers, Abdurrahman, in Raqqa's and Ergafa as well, I hope. So my, the solution is, especially our family, we have family experience more than 100 years. My grandfather who was the first man who exported this practices to Yemen. So we have that experience. So we know the problem. We know the solution as well. So the solution is that landowners can make a good decision about this matter. So, so it is up to them if they want to make a good decision, what is good for them in the near future. So that is, the, I hope, the solution. Forget the government, forget the buyers, forget the middleman, all this. So the problem or the solution lies with the landowners. So we don't want to give up and I hope in the near future we'll make, we will make a good decision regarding this matter. Thank you very much. Thank you Mr. Angelita for her presentation and research to our country. My question was uh, as we all are aware of, there is a, these functions are living things. They have diseases, they have competition in the area that they live with other species. They, can, they cannot carry up this sort of pressure. You say that there is a co economic uh, competition in going on the country and especially the region of Senag. But there's another problem. There's two-way rising. When, you, when the supply of this commodity increase, the, ca the capacity carrying of this species decrease or decline. As you, you have to see the, those people, those community living there, they used to cut out or to half a tree using a metal special to shave the tree. As if everybody knows the metal half uh, usually has a mercury organism living on it. And there's a disease breaking there. My suggestion was <coughs> rather than the economic issue there is an environmental issue, especially there is a disease which, which motivates this decline, this spirit, and it needs to research it. Furthermore, thank you. My name is Oyan Umul Khair Mohamud I study at University of Fergesa, especially in the Department of Environmental Science. And Victor uh, Angelita Di Carlo, and I'm not asking you a question, but I would like to thank you for your contribution and your motivation and your lecture, also in your field and into our country. 
and frankincense in, is one of the highest quality trees in the world and it's used in many uh, barbosis and, and different cultures uh, in the world. And also in, it is the, in our heritage and trees in Somaliland or special in, species of Somali in our country. And so and you mentioned many problems and like in, that tree was faced both environmentally and socially. And lastly, and I would I would like to say that is our um, responsibility to maintain that tree or that species, and especially Somalia landers. It is not to cringe to maintain and protect that tree. And that is all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your giving me finally for the for the question. And also, I'm going to thank uh, the doctor who present us a very useful issue is regarding with our environment. Now, what I'm going to ask is the final product that goes to EU, US, and China. And uh, as we know, sometimes a society believes something that it can cure some other things. But unless it has done scientifically, that thing will my disappear before it has been proven, that issue. Now, what I, was, what I want to ask you is this is finally proven that it can be used for a cancer cells or it is just a theory that is suggesting this can be a treatment for that. And, in, and, it's, and, and, and if that thing has proven, it's very obvious that this, this uh, mountain area cannot provide that uh, huge market which can overload this area and it will disappear within a short time because of that uh, market. So what is the theory behind this oil? Is it scientifically proven or is it just uh, something goes on? Thank you. Um, just about three weeks ago, one of the initial findings was released in the medical journals um, as having a positive impact on killing cancer cells. Um, the trials are showing good results. They are not completely finished. Uh, they're ongoing, but the results are coming in already. This is from the medical community, the international medical community. So these are peer-reviewed uh, results and studies that um, are definitive. So the initial findings that are coming in is that yes, there are components within these oils, uh, over 330 chemical compounds, very complex uh, chemical profile to these oils, and that there are compounds within the oils that have the ability to kill cancer cells up to stage four, uh, to very, very aggressive forms of cancer. So um, this is good news and bad news at the same time because uh, the oils are extremely valuable in medical applications. But as you said, this could create more of a resource curse situation and drive the price up even higher. So I know the Chinese are really looking to um, get a hold of more oils and more resins as the uh, oncological trials are continuing. So there's uh, some happening in China, some at Oklahoma State, uh, Virginia Tech. Uh, there's also trials with melanoma with, uh, in animals, using it on horses, had very good results. We're able to completely cure tumors. Um, and these are medical professionals, peer-reviewed studies. So they're, they're the highest form of science that we have. So um, also, I should mention that uh, pharmaceutical companies are working quite diligently to be able to synthesize some of these compounds in the lab uh, because they realize that the primary source uh, might not be here much longer and that's what Big Pharma does. It's part of their process to take natural compounds and then look to synthesize them in the lab and that research is underway as well. You can buy frankincense oil in the West that is not really from a tree um, we call it synthesized frankincense, but um, it's usually not as effective. Huh? And so 
there's lots of research going on right now on the medical applications for frankincense oils for Carteri and Ferriana, both. Thank you, uh, your presentation. And I, I am one of the, of the uh, in Ministry of Environment, and I worked with uh, this and uh, and uh, and Camifora, and also we have we have six species in here in Somaliland for gummies and rhizones. It is two for Buswelia, Carteri, and Ferrarina in Senag, while Camifora, two species, to Deity and Hadi is in also in Senag and other parts of the country. And two acacia type of gummies. Also, we have uh, acacia Senegal, Arabic gum. Also, although we are not we are not uh, producing, but we have these trees. And also, we have acacia seye, what we call it in Somali wadi. Uh, and also, we saw when we were, when, when I used to work in in this field, we we work. We saw that uh, the problem is the people are making this nowadays villages on on the sites of the where the plants were growing near, and then that this problem was duplicated the problem. These villages, and also. Uh, <coughs> This cut is another problem, as well as the, the, where the, the position of the, of the trees are very large place that cannot uh, control the ministry. Because it is from Elayo in east, from Sahel in west. It's large area, a remote area. So we cannot, these days we cannot afford to to control all, all this area. And even the owners of the, uh, these uh, trees are rented. While they rented, the, some uh, who, who were rented, they were of a tabbing. When they of a tabbing or the barking at the night time, the trees were dying. And another problem is, when they, when they when the, and generate another young trees, there was goats that can cut the young shootlet. Because previous times, the area of this cross are, were remote, far from the animal and far from the people, except the, the tabbing people. And that's another increasing the problem. And propagation. The propagation, we, we saw uh, the cartery can, can propagate. Uh, but we cannot uh, propagate the uh, Buswelia ferina. Uh, cartery, one tree grows in Ergafo. And one tree grows in by propagation and grows in Las Idli. But both trees, when they come, when they come from their niche and they transfer to another environment, they cannot produce as it was when they were in their climate. Uh, but uh, Kamifara can propagate easily. And also, Kamifara has not not valuable, uh, it's valuable as Suelia. Thank you very much. Okay, the presentation you made was shocking to me. Uh, although it came from that particular region, I didn't realize the magnitude of the problem. And I think one of the things we have to do is to have some sort of awareness in the political sphere of the country. I think the leaders, the political leaders of the country are not aware of the magnitude of the problem are not taken into a consideration in their political platforms. Uh, I know that it is a commercial good 
but it's also issue of identity and culture and history for us, uh, and the two should be balanced. Therefore, uh, by, by experience, I know our institutions are unable and unwilling to intervene things like that. Therefore, the regulation of this country is not, uh, in, ne in near future, closer to take any action uh, in order to have a sustainable harvest. Therefore, can we advocate for total a total ban or abridgment of export of Syrians out of the country, and then urge the government to have alternative economic income for the people who are there. Otherwise, I think we will be able to speak and do a lot of things, and at the end of the day, uh, Francis will be history. That's my land. When is that? Thank you very much. The government in alone cannot tackle a such problem. So that it requires, you know, to, to establish strong linkage among the, you know, government, the civil society, international institutions, and, and, and private companies. After that, the, the government can, you know, can do something. The other important thing is, you know, as you know, this kind of um, Buswelia trees is privately owned not the communal trees. So that it's very difficult. Marcasta, it's very difficult to control, you know, unsustainable harvesting of this tree. Because it's privately owned. And so that I can I'm suggesting, you know, to, to, to undertake a further, you know, investigation and research on, you know, regarding, you know, the users. It's you know, the users and the landowners are too different. Some of the landowners, they rent their lands to, you know, to, to, to use or, you know, uh, in somebody else. After that, the one who rented the trees can immediately, you know, harvest the trees unsustainably. The whole year round, they cut, they cut, they cut until the thing, until the trees dying. We cannot say that. Nobody can say that. The can carry no food curtain. Nobody can say that. It's a national asset. Actually, it requires, you know, you know, further, further research. <laughs>